Hello and welcome. My name is Peace Mitchell and I'm co-founder of Osmompreneur, the Women's Business School and Women Changing the World Press. Before we begin today, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I work and live on, the Mamu people of North Queensland. And I pay my respects to traditional owners and elders right across Australia and the Torres Strait. So today I am very excited to be launching our new book, Courage and Confidence, and introducing you to some of the authors of this book. Today we'll be hearing from five of our authors and I'd love you to join me in making them feel very welcome now. Please join me on stage. Hello. <laughs> so good to see you all. So I'd love to begin by going around the room and I'll get each of you to introduce yourself. But we'll start with you, Vanessa. For yeah. people who haven't met you before, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Vanessa. I'm based in Melbourne. Uh, I've got two boys, five and four, and an online business manager. What that means is that I provide online day-to-day -day operational support for thought leaders, coaches and mentors, uh, and I've also got a group of VAs who are mostly mums supporting in that. Uh, on a day-to-day, -day, that's what I do, and I and I strive to give my VAs opportunities to work that they can build their businesses while I try to build mine. So it's an honour and a privilege to be here. Well, thank you. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here, Vanessa. Thank you. We also have Marika here. Hi, Marika, how are you? Hello. <laughs> so, yes, so I'm Marika. I own Perth Virtual Services. So like Vanessa, it's a bit of an operational management business. So I help small and, me small and medium businesses across the Asia Pacific region. Um, I'm in my third year of business and I've been lucky enough to um, now be a multi-award winner for my services, which is very exciting, um, which has brought me to the place where I am now to be a part of this book as well. Um, I'm also the sole parent of a beautiful boy who's just turned four. Um, so he's a lot of my life and he's yeah definitely my inspiration for everything I do. Oh, beautiful. It's wonderful to have you here, Marika. Thank you. I'll go to you now, Justine. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks, Keith. I run Justine Martin Corporation. Um, I'm based in Geelong, Victoria. I was told 11 years ago by a medical professional that I would never be able to work again. Uh, I didn't quite listen to that. And now I own uh, four businesses, being Just Art, uh, Van Gogh Decals, Resilience Mindset, and a new one called Morpheus Publishers. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, it's wonderful to have you here, Justine, and I'm looking forward to having a chat with you a bit more later on. Um, so now we'll go to Jody Lee. Hi, Jody Lee. How are you? Hello, Peace. I'm wonderful. Very excited to be here, um, a part of this panel. Uh, so a little bit about me, I um, own Red Hot Blue, which is a creative agency, and we actually celebrate 25 years this year, um, which is very exciting. Um, we're based in, thank you, uh, we're based in beautiful Mackay, which is a regional location on the, the Whitsunday coast um, in Queensland, and um, it's a place I grew up, so very, very, you know, um, proud to have had this business here for this time. I'm a huge community um, advocate, so have established quite a lot of initiatives within the community during that time. And I'm a mum to two teenage daughters, uh, Tia and Piper, who are 15 and 13, who very much kick me on my toes for many reasons. Uh, yeah, so just so thrilled to be a part of this book um, and be sharing this with so many incredible women. Oh, well, it's wonderful to have you here, Jodie Lee. Thank you so much. All right, Karen Perks. Hello, how are you? Hi, Peace. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm ex well, extremely excited to be um, joining the panel today. And just before we went live, my book actually turned up. So that was a copy of it. So I was extremely excited when the doorbell was going. <laughs> um, I'm the owner of um, Ancient Wisdom Business Writers, and we uh, specialise in grant and tender writing, um, business documents, uh, award submissions, um, all the on marketing documents that businesses need to need to write um so we've been um 
uh, operating for about oh, just over two years, but I've been specialising in the industry for about 13 now, so a fairly long history. Um, based in Newcastle, which is um, not so sunny, but uh, faring, fair, faring very well compared to most of New South Wales at the moment. Um, and yeah, very, very excited to be part of this team. So yeah, look forward to today. Uh, thank you, Karen. It's wonderful having you here. And now, Karen McDermott. Hello, hello. How are you? Hello, hello, everyone. I am great and hope that you all are too. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Karen McDermott. <coughs> and I'm a publisher, author, lots of different hats person. <laughs> But well, primarily, um, my passion is helping stories get out into the world. So I show up and do that wherever is needed. Um, I am a publisher at KMD Books, Serenity Press and MMH Press. And I love to join Peace and Katie on the journey of bringing these books to life. And something really powerful happens whenever these ladies bring women together into a book. And I have the honor of sharing story in here. And I try to share a different story in every book. This is my 20th anthology. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, wow. So, and, and everyone has a different story. So we all have lots of stories to tell and, and we can all, you know, choose to share different things. Yeah, it's amazing. So I am a proud mum of six kids from six, eight, 11, 13, 16, and 25. There we go. I'm a busy bee. <laughs> You are a busy bee, and we are so grateful to be collaborating with you to bring this book to life, Karen. So thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. So now we might dive a bit deeper, and we'll start with you, Vanessa. Yep. So um, your chapter, can you tell us a bit about your chapter and what you talked about in your Encouraging Confidence? That's really around self-care and listening to your inner voice. I think that's what I've kind of tried to capture in my in my chapter. Um, it's really about as a mum, as a business owner, trying to dedicate time for you, however that looks for you, so that you can look after yourself, so that you can look, look after other people. Um, I've found as a, being a business owner myself, especially as a business manager, you've, I've found that I've been pulled left, right and centre by a number of clients and the team and this and that, and I never really dedicated time to myself. So... I uh, provided some some of my experience around listening to my inner voice that kind of said, Vanessa, you need to slow down, look after yourself before you crash and burn. You don't want to do that. Um, so I just provide some my own personal experience uh, as well as providing some strategies on how to stop, listen to your inner voice and really just, you know, start small and dedicate time to yourself so that you can be the best human and person that you can be. So hopefully it's useful to those who read it. I have shared my personal experiences, so I really hope that it resonates but like everybody else, I'm a working mum, I'm human, I sleep up, uh, but hopefully the chapter will provide some, you know, strategies, practical strategies uh, on how other people can do the same thing, on how other mums can do the same thing. Mm. Now, you talk about burnout. Is that something you've experienced personally in your journey? Look, I think it depends on, on how you, what you consider burnout to be. I think if you're called working almost 24-7 over a week or two to get stuff done, to manage the family, to manage the kids you know, to keep food on the table, then absolutely, I've been there, done that. Mm. Uh, it's not a place where I want to visit again because I'm, I was just not in the right headspace, you know. I was too exhausted. I, I'm surprised that I was able to function. Um, but that was when I first became a, a business owner and, you know, I was trying to navigate my way through and trying to grow the business and the business was exciting and I wanted to invest it all but then I had to be a mum and I was like, oh, I don't want to be a mum right now. I want to work on the business. So then I had to work after hours and then I got cranky with the kids so it just like, it's just not sustainable. So I learned that the hard way that it's just no, just stop. Mm. Things will happen when they're meant to happen. Just learn to breathe, stop and pause and look after you first and everything will just evolve as it should. Yeah, I think that's a really common thing for so many people when they're starting out in business. I mean, we love what we do and as entrepreneurs we're so excited about uh, our dreams and making them into reality that it is really tempting to work long hours to mm. get things moving faster. But Absolutely. actually, it's less productive, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it's really around learning to take those breaks, which I was really bad at, especially when COVID struck and our, you know, our industry, the online industry flourished. I just found myself going to meeting after meeting after meeting and not actually stopping, pause, you know, have a breath, walk, go for a walk. Um, so, yeah, it's just really important now to listen to your inner voice so that you can look after yourself so that you can have a sustainable business. 
um, you know, mm. into the future and be the best mum that you can be and, and human that you want to be as well. So really important. And, and what are some of the ways that you tap into that inner voice? Well, I just I try to make a habit of just list like just pausing in between like it just practical things like in between meetings I'll pause and say okay how am I feeling do I need to go get a drink do I need to stretch oh you know I'm just more conscious of it now I think because I've I've, I've experienced the other side of the spectrum where I ignored it right mm. so the example I include in my chapter is being in a um, relationship with someone the father of my kids and my inner voice was screaming at me Vanessa what are you doing you're not happy you're not happy you're not happy it took COVID and me finally cracking, reaching the extreme level of exhaustion and unhappiness for me to actually do something about it. So from that experience, I've learned, no, that's not the best way to handle things. That's not the best way to handle if you're unhappy with anything. You've got to listen to that voice. So I've used mm -hmm. that experience to pause more often, to reflect on how I'm feeling. Am I enjoying working with a client, for example? Am I enjoying being a mum at this moment? What can I do and pause more often so that I can just be present and reflect and then shift my thinking or do something about it, go for a walk outside, go see the plants, um, et cetera, et cetera. Do my nails, like I'm adamant to do my nails every three weeks because, like, no, that's my time. I'm not negotiating on that. That's solid. That's fixed. So it's just, I mean, I think sometimes you've got to go, to, you've got to experience the worst before you can experience the better and work towards feeling that, being that, you know, have, achieving that optimal state of mind. So it's just creating that habit. And sometimes I slip up, absolutely, uh, but it's just around being consistent. Yeah. You know, when you were talking just then, you, you were talking about that voice was telling you, you know, you need to pay attention now. You've got to make a change. But mm. for so long, you've been ignoring that voice. And I think that's something that a lot of people do. They don't listen to that voice mm. and they don't take the action and they're stuck mm. in those situations for much longer than, than they should be. Mm. Why is it, do you think, that we don't always listen to that? in a voice that's telling us what we need to do and what we need to know. I think it's the fear of the unknown. I think we often get comfortable in our own space and our own situation and we don't know any different or we don't want to know any different. It does take it does take a lot of courage and to face the fear of the unknown. But I've found through my own experience that it's not that bad. Like once you do it, it's like, oh, yeah. okay, it wasn't that bad. The world didn't collapse around me and everything's okay. You know, but I think we often, it's our own self-talk and our own convincing that, no, no, it's not going to work out. I can't do it. It's our own sense of our own self-esteem that, that believes that we can't do it or, con or we convince ourselves that we can't, which in turn stops us. Um, so I think it takes time to pluck up that courage and that, you know, that motivation to combat that fear because sometimes, like myself, I had to reach the extreme unhappiness before I did something about it. And that's okay, but I think it's just really important to... Forgive yourself if you don't move on or if you don't acknowledge it because you are only human and you've got so much to juggle in life that it's okay. But to also acknowledge it and say, well, what would it be like? You know, let's try it and see what it will be like. The world won't end. You know, it won't be the drastic situation that you envisage is what I'm saying because often we make the work and it's not even halfway, half of what we expected. Yeah. yeah, it's very true. Often our worries of what, what it's going to be like and our fears are so much bigger than the reality and and most of the time those fears and worries don't ever happen absolutely and if they do i mean we're, we're strong independent fierce women we will deal with it as and when the situation comes up you know we're mums we can handle anything yeah so is self-care part of your daily routine do you have a morning ritual or how do you make self-care work in your life yeah so i don't have a ritual anymore i used to but now i just kind of let the day guide me through so now I try to fit in a walk if I can't fit in a walk I used to punish myself for that but now I'm like no it's fine so now I you know try to stand at my desk and move around like I am now during our during our conversation now I'm standing up moving around so at least my body's moving um, you know I'll go outside in my backyard I've planted flowers and I'll go water them for example or look at them and look at the beautiful color even if that's just for five minutes then I'll do that I'll make my several cup of coffees throughout the day which is totally acceptable in my opinion that's my break. That's my self-care moment. I'm happy with that. You know, it's as simple as having the blinds up, having the, the sun come through the room, which really lifts up my mood. So that's my way of incorporating self-care into my day. Plus my dog is snoring behind me on my bed, so she's always a great comfort to have. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. And, yeah, I hope people read your book and 
find that wisdom to tap into their own inner voice and, and listen to the messages it has for us because it knows what we need, it knows what we need to do next and how to care for us. It sure does. It sure does. Thank you, Peace. I appreciate it. Thanks, Vanessa. Well, let's go to Karen Perks now. Karen, please join me. Hi, Peace. How are you? I'm really good. I'm really good. It's wonderful to have you here. Now, Thanks. in your chapter, you talked about your favourite quote, which is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Mm. Why was this simple quote so important and meaningful to you? Um, that quote was actually shared with me um, very early on in my uh, banking career. Um, and uh, it actually resonates because it's really important. Um, I think when you plan, you actually give comfort. You get comfort from the security in knowing um, you have options and, and how things will progress. And the, the, the biggest challenge in um, new projects or businesses or anything in life is the unknown. But if you plan out some steps, then you're actually removing the unknown because you, you've got the steps in, in how you're going to progress. So um, for me in, in my life, it's, it's been critical in, and, and a foundation for how I um, execute, yeah, everything that I do. And it, mm. it works well. Mm. Yeah. Um, but as you talk about in your chapter, sometimes you can have the best laid plans and everything planned out and know exactly what you want to happen, but something will come out of nowhere which will just completely change everything in an instant. Can you tell us about what happened and, and how that impacted you? Yeah, so it's, it's great to have a plan. The, pl um, the plan has to be fluid, so you should be able to adapt the plan and the steps as um, as things progress. But life throws, you know, life, you can't, as, as I did learn, life, you can't plan for life. Um, you can map, but you definitely can't, can't plan. So um, uh, when 17 years ago, when um, I was having my third child, I actually got a virus that went to my heart and developed um, cardiomyopathy. So that was probably the most, that was the life-changing event. And through everything of what I had um, planned as how my life would, you know, map out in a, um, you know, in, into the future, change. And it's really, um, it was uh, the worst thing and the best thing that that ever happened to me. So it took a while to work out. It was, you know, part of the best thing. But um, it was, uh, yeah, the most extremely debilitating and, um, um, yeah, it changes who you are as a person. And that's that's hard to, um, to build into a plan uh, of how you see your future. Mm. Mm. But, it, but that, that simple phrase, fail to plan, plan to fail, kept you strong through the whole rehabilitation process. It Just did. That. Yeah, thanks, Peace. It, um, I think when, when people experience trauma, um, you know, the initial stages of trauma, um, uh, you know, it, it often feels like you're just drowning, but there becomes a point where you can actually start to see and see the future. And that was the point in time where I actually then was able to replan. And it was like starting with a, a brand new scratch book that you, um, you know, that I'd bought from the art supply place. And I was able to completely rewrite um, what my future would look like and plan and then make plans um, and steps as to how I would, you know, could achieve the things, the new things that I wanted to achieve in my life. Mm. Mm -hmm. So planning, planning is was very important and it also gives comfort that you have um, some direction as to how you're going to get out of um, what is a, often a deep hole. Mm. Yeah, and you did you you did recover, and you went back to working. You were working part time, and then you went to full time. But you found that the traditional workplace just it doesn't work 
for people with a disability. Can you no. talk about that? Yeah. The, um, it's really sad, in, you know, International Women's Day was yesterday and we're still talking about um, the, the, the same things over and over again. Um, and living with chronic illness um, and disability um, and being a female, a woman is, you know, it's a really bad combination. <laughs> um, so the, the traditional workplace um, just doesn't fit uh, for people or for, for many people. And I'll just talk about me in particular. Um, you're managing, I had three children under seven. Um, by this stage, you know, we're five years past the diagnosis and, uh, you know, ready to go back to work. So, um, you know, what should have been the prime of my career, I'm um, only physically able to cope with, you know, X amount of hours and still juggling, you know, children who are, uh, you know, under 10. So it's it's a hard balance and there's not a lot of give in the traditional workplaces. Um, so we run, you know, it has actually influenced me um, significantly in how we structure our um, our workplace in, you know, flexibility. Um, we've got contractors who work anything from five to 25 hours depending on their life demands and, and you can make it work. Um, you don't have to have a fixed person in the office sitting at a desk just because it gives you comfort that they're... Um, you can see them. It's, you know, I think COVID has definitely um, exposed the uh, larger corporations to that model that it just, you know, it's not how it needs to be. Mm. Yeah, and I love that there's people like you who are running businesses and who value flexibility and who are offering the ability mm. for people to work, you know, five hours a week if they want to, 25 hours a week if they want to, whatever works for them, that kind of, that level of flexibility is something that mm. traditional workplaces aren't mm. offering. And I think COVID, some of them started to a bit, but I know that a lot of them have just gone back into the office and expecting people to be there 40 hours plus a week again. Yes. That elastic band has definitely retracted very quickly, um, mm. is my observation. And it's, um, it actually builds happy people in the workforce. You know, um, from a, a resource perspective, if you know that you need 40 hours of or 50 hours of um, human resources to complete a task, then just engage two people, like split the task. It's, I'm, I really struggle with why it's so difficult to... Um, uh, to have a, a blended and flexible model. But anyway, it works for us. We love it. And, um, yeah, we won't, we won't be changing. Yeah, and I love that you are leading the way um, in flexibility and, and showing other people that it's possible and you're doing it. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Karen. We might go to our next guest now, Jodie Lee. Jodie Lee, please join me on stage. Hello, Peace. Hi, it's wonderful to have you here. Now, your chapter was called Into the Unknown. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what that means to you? Yeah, um, I guess for me, uh, I've always loved new experiences. So as a kid, had a curious and creative mind and always exploring. Uh, so for me, embracing new experiences, the unknown was always refreshing. But I learnt, I guess, the, the turning point point for me of realising that not everybody sees the world that way and, and it obviously embraces the unknown. Um, I guess particularly as my business started to grow and, um, you know, a, and a wonderful business mentor I had for many years, but probably the, the most key part of that change was the arrival of our first daughter, um, Tia, who at the age of three was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is on the autism spectrum. And just listening to Karen there, um, very much our world had to become very regimented, very planned. Um, people on the spectrum, obviously, the unknown for them is what causes great anxiety. So it was quite ironic, really. You've got a mum who embraces, um, you know, left of centre, 
um, you know, going a million miles an hour, um, embracing the unknown to a world that I had to very quickly um, take a very different perspective and, and learn. So a very steep learning curve. But yeah, I guess that's what it was all about for me is that everything um, I've created or developed or, or achieved has always been at starting at ground level and um, which is the unknown, which is which can be very exciting, but for some people it can be quite daunting too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and challenging too for some people. But yeah. you've always had this um, this attitude and you write about it in your book of, of no fear and, you know, asking that question, well, what do I have to lose? And, yeah. uh, and just going for it. Can you tell us a bit, a bit about how that kind of attitude has really helped you in your business? Yeah, look, um, I don't know where that comes from. And I was actually talking to my dad yesterday, um, obviously reflecting on um, you know, my teenage years, obviously because of our two teenage girls. And I think I've always had self-belief um, and I really attribute that, I guess, to mum and dad. You know, they didn't come from a creative background or a business background, but there was, they always fostered in myself and my sister that anything was possible. And I think when you've got people who you look up to and who truly believe in you, there is this sense inside you that I can do anything. So, um, and look, that's not necessarily without hard work. Um, you know, I remember high school, like I was gonna be a vet for crying out loud, which is <laughs> physics and maths one and chemistry. And my poor dad, he was my tutor and none of it came easy, but I actually ended up doing quite well because I worked hard at it. But there was a, a very distinct realization that you know, let's go what you're naturally um, gifted with rather than the, the hard yards um, of, you know, a career in that math science area. But look, I really feel, and I, and I think when I look to my daughters and, and the era of which uh, children are growing up these days is there is a real lack of self-belief. And I, I just feel that, you know, you can do anything. If you put your mind to it, you can do anything obviously surrounding yourself with amazing people um, really helps too. And um, I just, yeah, I guess what I want to get across, you know, from my chapter was that, you know, for people out there that give it a go, what have you got to lose, you know? And I'm very much a big believer of no regrets. Better have tried, better have tried and failed than always wonder what if. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about the people who've been part of your team over the last 25 years, and you've had over 50 staff members um, yeah. across that time. Can you tell us about working with staff? Like, what are the important qualities that you look for when you're choosing people to join the team? Yeah, look, um, you know, my staff, my team are everything to me. I The culture of our business is not something that happens by accident, but it's something that you know, I've worked really hard because I feel as though if we're going to spend, you know, eight, nine, sometimes 10 hours with these people, we're spending more time with them sometimes than we are our family. So it's got to be a place where when you step through the doors, you enjoy uh, for the most part. Of course, there's going to be, you know, the challenges and the, the tasks that may not be as enjoyable. But yeah, look, the qualities, I guess we, we always refer to the Red Hot Blue family. And mm -hmm. For me, that's really important. We've had some exceptional um, designers land on our doorstep, but unfortunately their attitude um, just isn't the right fit. And for me, one person can take a whole team down. You know, mm -hmm. um, a team needs to be united. They need to be there to help their fellow teammate. And I really believe, you know, in a regional location, it's not always easy to find the expertise that we need in the, in the space we work in, which is, you know, design, advertising, marketing, the digital space that obviously we've grown into over the years. Um, but for me, it's, it's an important space for these people to come each and every day and know that they feel valued. Um, and that they can be authentically themselves. So, yeah, and, you know, some of these uh, team members who I remember one of my first, she was a graduate, um, she's been overseas, she's got married, she's had two children, and I'm still very much in touch with her. 
there's a lot of people who have moved on and grown or moved away. Um, but it's really, really, you know, rewarding to see their growth. But it's also really special to know we're still a part of each other's lives. Yeah, um, that's and, and look, the current team, you just, uh, you couldn't, I couldn't do it without them. I wouldn't want to do it without them either. You know, they bring so much to my world and I just, um, yeah, I value them greatly. Yeah, and I'm sure that you've had to rely on them over the years because, you know, in your chapter you talk about when you received the diagnosis for your daughter of autism and there were three things that the doctors told you and the first one was that there's no cure, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty hard news to take, I'm sure. Um, the second one was that early intervention was crucial and so early intervention for you, it meant flying to Brisbane, it meant going to specialists and appointments and all of those things. Um, but at the same time, your business continued because you had that team behind you supporting you. Can you tell us about those early days when you first got the diagnosis and, and navigating yeah, all that? It was, um, it, it floored me because Tia was advanced in so many ways. You know, she um, had reached milestones ahead of children her age. She, her language was incredible. She could dress herself, all of these sorts of things. But, you know, you give her the wrong colour plate or, you know, and she'd have a meltdown. So after a very long journey, when I got the phone call to say it's, um, you know, such and such from Mackay ASD Clinic, I actually had to ask what that actually stood for. I didn't even know that ASD was Autism Spectrum Disorder. So um, talk about throwing yourself into the unknown. <laughs> that, that represented it very well. Um, but like anything, for me, it was about embarking on this journey of discovery and hearing those words, the early intervention, and that my husband and I, you know, we really held the key to Tia's um, success, um, just meant that we had to do everything we could. So that's what we did. And yeah, it did mean, you know, we, Tia and I flew to Brisbane um, every week for eight weeks straight um, to, t to attend um, small uh, group sessions to help her learn you know, how to be a good friend. Um, so the, the thing with often children on the spectrum and particularly Asperger's, which are high functioning, um, it's not intuitive. These are learned skills. So the sooner you get that wired, that wiring into their minds, um, obviously the better outcomes there can be. So yeah, lots of traveling, lots of attending workshops because learning myself and understanding how to, um, I guess, approach these situations was one thing, but the other side to it was also educating those people around us. So that included family, that included schools, parents and other children. And, and that was really important for me because I think like any causes, any disabilities, any diseases, um, awareness is such a big part of it. And it's something that I continue to do because I am so passionate about it. So, yeah, look, I wrote, I wrote a little book every year that would sit in the classroom so that the children and parents could read and understand people wanted to understand and learn. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, but on the flip side of that, there was those that just, it was too hard. So you, you learn very quickly the people that you need on your team. And you mentioned my team here at Red Hot Blue and absolutely without their dedication to the brand, um, to me, to everything we were achieving, um, you know, it, it possibly wouldn't have continued without them. So, yeah, very, very proud of, of, of all of them and, and the contribution that they've made. Yeah. And also my family, you know. Uh, without them, because obviously we had another little one by this stage. So Piper was, you know, only one year of age and a lot of that travel meant that, you know, grandparents, the wonderful grandparents, and we've got both sets here with us, um, you know, they'd have to step in and, and help a lot. So as much as there's been some tough times, I feel very blessed for all of the beautiful people that I do have in my life. Yeah, it sounds like you have wonderful support around you, Jodie. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, speaking up and being open, um, you know, my husband often jokes that I share way too much and I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I've always been that way. But I'm also a big believer that 
by not having walls up around you allows other people to have that vulnerability. And the amount of times I've had a chat in a coffee shop or at the supermarket and I may have burst into tears and then this person is sharing with me some of their challenges. There just needs to be more of that, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. And, and the more we share, the more we can connect with people. And um, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Jody Lee. And uh, a shout out to the team at Red Hot Blue. We love the cover of this book, which you and your team designed for us. So thank, thank you. you yes. so, so Our strong. wonderful creative director, Scott Turner, a shout out to him. Um, thank, yeah, you. thank you. And, and we love that we were able to not only myself have a chapter in it, but be a part of the, the cover. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jody Lee. Thanks. All right. We'll go to Marika now. Marika, please join me on stage. Hi, how are you? I'm really good, Marika. It's wonderful to have you here. I was reading your chapter and something that stood out for me was that you believe that you need to be passionate about what you do. Can you tell us why that's so important? Oh, absolutely. I think when you're really passionate about what you do and I think for most people when they start their business they do have that passion um it just gives you that drive and the motivation to just you really really want to succeed so you put everything you have into that um but in saying that you know business can can fluctuate as well um mm -hmm. and sometimes it's it's easy to lose that motivation or kind of go with the ebb and flow of the changes in business. But it's not, it's the thing is that happens with most businesses. It's just the way it goes. It's never going to be perfect and going uphill all the time. There are, especially in the early days of business. So I think, you know, a lot of people put the onus on themselves. What am I doing wrong? It must be something that's not right in the business. And often, so often I think that comes back to people's past experiences and their emotions and and something that's sort of affected their confidence um, in the past that's changes the way that they react to things so you know so I the way what I'm talking about in my workshop today what I talk about in my book is sorry in our book <laughs> in my chapter um, is sort of delving into that inner side of yourself um, to work through those emotions and optimise your business a bit more and have that alignment, so. Mm. And I was reading your chapter and there's been so many challenges that you've had to overcome in your yeah. life personally. Um, can you tell us a bit about that journey and what that's been like for you? Yeah, so um, when I was 14, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So, um, it was quite a debilitating disease. I spent most of that year in hospital. I was told my life wouldn't be the same. I might not have children. Um, so hearing that at the age of 14, when you're just going through puberty and all those sorts of things was, was very difficult. Um, and you know, like other people in life, you know, I have lost family members, close family members, um, probably five or six altogether, including my brother. I've dealt with, you know, my, my father's been through brain tumours. I've had a major car accident um, and there's a few other things as well. So, yeah, there's been a lot of traumatic times in my life where I've had to really delve into myself and work on my emotions and find that inner strength and you just, it just opens up a different view and you see things so differently. So to be able to harness that and use that in working with your business is um yeah, a very important thing, I think, and it really helps you to achieve that greater level within your business. So, mm. yeah. and, you know, in your chapter, you talk about the car accident and the amount of time it took for rehabilitation. Um, yeah. That must have been a lot of courage <laughs> and resilience and strength. To yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so I had some internal injuries. Um, I damaged my shoulder. I didn't have movement of my arm for several months. Um, I had to have facial surgery. So I looked a little bit like the elephant man for probably about six months. It really morphed my face and seeing my face covered in stitches, it was very difficult looking in the mirror. 
But on a different level, I also had um, a severe brain trauma. So I lost 70% of my memory. I couldn't understand sometimes what people were saying because I got confused what words meant. I couldn't remember people's names who I'd known for 10 years. I don't think I even remembered how old I was. It was so it was very challenging. Um, and the doctors sort of said to me they weren't sure if I would ever get the capacity back. So that was quite frightening. Um, but I just persevered. Um, I'll go through, I delve through that into the book in the book um, and in my workshop today of just sort of delving into my inner self and finding that strength and finding a pathway through those challenging times, which I still use today. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. difficult times, but I think, you know, you do, it does pass and you can work through it. It's just finding the pathway that works for you. Yeah. And then in your chapter, you actually say that in hindsight, the universe was preparing you for something better. Absolutely. Um, and it took me a while to think like that. But because I lost so much of my memory, um, if you if you think about it this way, your memories over time and what your experiences and what you go through makes you who you are. It sets your personality. So I felt very lost for a long time. And then I started getting little snippets of memories. But I was confused because I wasn't sure if they were dreams or memories. So it took a mm. long time to kind of put the puzzle together and get get that back um but i've lost my train of thought a little bit now i was focusing on my thing <laughs> um but yeah look it's it's just something that you you sort of work with so yeah and things worked out for the better in the long run yeah it did so i mean i guess it really made me focus on building myself from the ground up again what I wanted out of life, where I wanted to go, where I was then, and yeah, just really work on my myself a lot more and and my life, and just yeah, get it to the best point it could be. And I've really worked hard to do that. So yeah, yeah, you absolutely have. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your session later on today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marika. Well, we might go to. Uh, we'll go to Justine now. Justine, please join me on stage. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Pete. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's wonderful to have you here, Justine. Now, Justine, you call yourself the Resilience Queen. Can you tell me about how you got that title and what it means to you? Um, I've had a lot of adversity uh, throughout my uh, 51 years. can't believe I just said that out loud. Um, <laughs> no one likes to say their age, do they? Uh, so it really started, my mum had MS when um, I was about nine and I went through a lot of adversities um, back with her health. And then uh, when I turned 40, I was diagnosed with MS and then that was in 2011. And then 2013, 14 and 15, um, I underwent heart surgeries and had complications from those. And then 2016, um, I got diagnosed with melanoma. They stumbled upon it um, and then got diagnosed with uh, lymphoma and leukaemia all at the same time. Um, and then came through that and went into remission. And um, I was told 11 years ago I'd never be able to work again. And uh, I listened to that medical professional uh, for a period of time. And then he told me to find a hobby and I picked up a paintbrush and, and learned how to paint. And then five months after um, painting, I... Uh, I sold my first piece and made $300 of my money. And I'm like, oh, I still have some purpose. I have some purpose in creating art and have some purpose yeah. in still, you know, making some money and contribute back into society. And uh, then thought, well, I want to help other people. And, and everyone kept saying to me, why are you so positive? You know, with everything that's gone wrong, how mm -hmm. can you remain positive what are your secrets what's the key and I really didn't know um which might shock some people but I didn't you know it had just become my way of life and my way of living and 
uh, I had to really sit down and evaluate, okay, why was I so different than other people and and what was the secrets and what was the key and what were my coping mechanisms? And um, then people started calling me the queen of resilience and that tag kind of stuck and I went, maybe I can market that. So uh, that's how the queen of resilience uh, came about. Yeah, it's, it's incredible um, the number of challenges that you faced in the last 10 years. It's, mm. uh, it was just one thing after the other, it seems. And, it, and look, it still is. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with a broken arm um, through domestic violence at the moment and, you know, that's I'm 14, 15 months down the track from that and unfortunately on Monday um, uh, my cancer's back. So I've got the challenge of um dealing with lymphoma and leukemia again um which you know i know that um i'll beat it so again um so i'm in for another fight of my life so uh, i'll i'll be using my own coping mechanisms and reading my own chapter in the book and um to get through that but um that won't stop me oh, i'm sorry to hear that justine that's um, thanks yeah that's sad news Oh gosh, but you have from right there. But you know, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. So um, you know, positive mindset is is the key. So um, yeah, yeah, it's been a tough couple of days, and um, uh, but I cannot tell you that the book, our book, turned up after I'd come home from the. Um, the specialist and I opened it up and I looked at the front cover and I went courage and confidence and that's the key that's really the key and and to have so many inspiring stories in that book and so much hope in that book on all the adversities that everyone has faced um everyone needs to go and buy a copy and and not just read my chapter but everyone's chapter is 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 it's just remarkable that's just incredible. I'm just getting teary to think that right when you came home, there was courage and confidence in like real form right there waiting for you. That's so powerful. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I did a live stream of opening it up and I got teary opening it up. So, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was meant to be. It was meant to be. And, and it's a reminder as well. You know, we all face adversities in our life all the time, every single day. Um, and, you know, resilience is, resilience means how quickly you bounce back from those, those adversities. And, um, you know, having the coping mechanisms, mechanisms in place. And that's what my chapter is about. I mentioned I've developed the eight top tips resilience and I mentioned five of them just briefly in the chapter and and you know everyone needs that in their life I mean so we're all born with resilience um mm. some of us have encountered more adversities than what others have and um, I'm not one that stays in that adversity I look for a way a means um, around it so you know we don't give up we, we modify modify we're pliable and when you're open to being you know pliable um, things become a lot easier in your life so I will I will look at my life at the moment and I will adjust it accordingly what needs to step back and you know as some of the other authors have said you know self-care so self-care is really important in my life as well and um, I've got you know, a lot of commitments in volunteer work and it's like, okay, well, I need to pull them back at the moment and um, take care of the self-care in me before I can help other people and, and not mm. feel guilty about that as well. Um, yeah. But the book I think, is such a powerful book of amazing stories. Yeah, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. But I think your advice about being pliable, about, you know, well, you've got a goal or you've got things that you want to do, but it's okay if they don't all happen in exactly the perfect way that you had initially envisaged. If, if you need more time for self-care, then invest in your self-care. Do what feels good for you. Um, and if 
you need more time for working, then you can do that. But it is important to have that kind of balance and that flexibility in how you do things. And I think that was something that was really uh, clear in your chapter that despite all these adversities, you were able to navigate them through positivity and through being pliable. And another quality you talked about was persistence. Can you tell us about persistence? Some would say persistence. Others, others would say who know me that I'm annoying, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um I look, I set goals. I um I'm big, huge on setting goals, vision boards, manifesting, um, and being persistent uh, with all of that. And, you know, if something's not working, like I'll give something a period of time and, you know, a couple of months. And if it's not working in that time, I then look at it and go, okay, I need to reassess. This is not working. What can I do? And then change some of my actions and still be persistent in doing it, but you know, reevaluate everything um, all the time because you know, time to me is the most precious commodity. You can't buy it, reuse it, sell it, or borrow it. So be very careful on who you spend it with and what you spend it on. How many people are stuck in jobs that they don't like? We yeah. all have a choice. We all have that choice. We can change what we're doing and be persistent in in what you're doing um don't listen to other people's false beliefs you know people say to me all the time oh you're doing too much how can you do that well i can do that that's how my mind works that's your belief not my belief you know you tell someone what your your big goal is or your big dream is and they'll go oh why do you want to do that why do you want to do that? That's never going to work. Okay, well, that's your belief. That's not mine because I'm telling you now, it is going to work and I am going to do it. Just like my neurologist said to me 11 years ago, you will never work again. Okay, well, I'll never work a conventional job again, but I'm working now and I'm making money now and I'm helping a lot of people now. But if I'd listened to him, I would be sitting in what was the sanctuary of my home but also had become my jail because I didn't see anyone and I couldn't help anyone um, and, and that was an issue. Yeah. Oh, you're incredible, Justine, and um, your positivity and resilience and determination just shine through in everything you're saying uh, and in your chapter. So please make sure you get a copy of Courage and Confidence and read Justine's chapter. She's simply amazing. Thank you so much for being here today, Justine. Uh, we're so honoured to have you as one of our co-authors in this book. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. I'd now like to bring up our final guest, Karen McDermott. Karen, please join me on stage. Hi, how are you? Oh, we can't hear you, Karen. You're on mute. There we go. I muted myself. <laughs> Isn't Justine amazing? Isn't her and all of our other authors the reason why we do what we do? These stories need to get out into the world and ignite ignite what it is within others, you know, those messages. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. When, yeah. I, when I set my intention for this week, my intention was amplifying women's voices and I'm so proud to be doing that. And uh, I'm so happy to have you here because your chapter was all about raising each other up. Can you tell us about what that means to you, Karen? Absolutely. And I had a bit of courage in this chapter as well, please, because I, mm -hmm. I tiptoed into sharing about the universal laws and how I make things happen through manifesting. So a bit of, it's not so much woo-woo as it is woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm all about um, rising each other up, you know, the, the, the thing with new, the new wave of inspired leadership that there is out there in the world, gone are the dictators, you know, people don't have time for that anymore. We want inspired leaders who don't keep it all to themselves, you know, because, you know, the way they talk about all the leaders of the past all knew this, this secret of how to make amazing things happen in their life, but they never shared it. And that's what the, the wrong thing was. Everybody should know how to um, really 
create the life of their dreams and show other people how to do it. And that's what we're here for. We're not here to learn these things, keep them to ourselves and not let other people know about it. So I um, I talk about in the chapter how I answered, I had the courage to answer the call to write a novel, which led to me, in me it, was, it was a catalyst into publishing for me. And, um, and it was courageous and, you know, like, I, I think I had four kids at the time and we just moved from Ireland, all of those kinds of things. So it was a new life, new beginnings. And then this started to call pretty loud. So I answered the call and by goodness, have I not been on the best adventure ever since. And it takes courage. And I always remember and I always talk about and I think I mentioned in the chapter about coming to the Oz Mumpreneur Conference in was it 2019 or tw yeah, 2019 or 2018. And I just signed the Duchess of York and and Katie says, God, Karen, you're fearless. And I was like, well, there's no fear in knowing because when you learn to trust and have faith in your journey and you, there's there's no you, there's no question, you just know that what is the hell yes and what is the hell no. So, yeah. Yeah, and that knowing just has led you on all kinds of adventures, hasn't it? <laughs> it does, it has done and it will continue to. <laughs> And it's the best business tool that you can use because um, I write as K.P. Weaver in my philosophical and metaphysical kind of writing, but because I like to keep Karen McDermott as my publisher hat. But the two worlds have are colliding and I get called now to, to talk on the power of knowing a lot because when you know how to know, you can make decisions with unwavering confidence. There's no fluffing mm -hmm. around. You can just get on with the job and you have total faith in the destination and where you're going so it really excites me to teach people the tools on how to do that because that's how you get things done and inject it with a bit of, of loving intention and that's the super fuel to success so karen just quickly we don't have a lot of time but how do you tap into that voice of knowing well, I always said that we're all born with the ability to know. We just lose it along the way. Too many people are leaning outside for answers that are actually inside and we're supposed to lean outside for the support to make it happen. And, and that's how we, you know, we work together and, and make amazing things happen. So I have a three step knowing strategy that I use. And um, so I set big intentions. Justine talked about it in, in the, you know, I set big, fat, audacious goals. Remember when we used to talk about those things? <laughs> big, fat, audacious goals. And it excites me. And I know the essence of where I want to go, but I don't limit the results in that because as you go on the journey, things grow and actually get bigger than you could ever imagine. So I, I allow that it to, to grow. So I set intentions, not goals. And the reason being is because a goal comes with steps to achieve it. So all the focus goes on the steps. When you set an intention, which takes a bit more courage <laughs> because it's, the results aren't guaranteed, but they actually are guaranteed because when you have the courage to go on the journey towards your intention, you will be guided and you have faith in, in that knowing and um, that the opportunities and the inspired thoughts that you need to action will, will present themselves to you once you keep aware of it and, and commit to the journey. And you will know because it'll catch your attention and then you will ask yourself, is this aligned with where I'm going? And if it's a yes, you say a hell yes, and you action it straight away. You have the courage to action it straight away because you fluff around there, you know, somebody else will pick it up. And and the universe loves it. It loves people that act fast and, and just know, you know, with confidence where they're going. But if it's a uh or a no, have the courage to say no because we can say no with love. You don't have i was a yes person but i had to learn to say no because it wasn't i wasn't serving anyone because my heart wasn't in it and so when you say no with love people are totally understanding go that's that's okay you can say no sorry that's not right for me right now but thank you for asking and then someone who really has their heart in it can pick up on it and, and be the right person for the job so and um, i feel that i do a disservice if i say yes when it's my heart is a no <laughs> Yeah, definitely, and um, a disservice to yourself as well. And as to the, the person, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Karen. We're out of time, but always a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much for being part of this beautiful book, Courage and Confidence. We are just in love with it. I am loving all of these stories. I'm loving chatting with all of these incredible authors. And I'm so excited to see this book going out into the world very soon. So thank you so much, Karen, for being here today. And thank you to all of our authors. I have just had so much fun talking with all of you in this session today. And yes, I can't wait, can't wait to see this book going out into the world and people all over the world reading this book and being inspired by your stories. It's just been beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and everybody who's tuned in on the live stream. We will see you again soon for our next session of the Courage and Confidence Launch Festival. But for now, we are signing off. Bye, everyone. Bye.